Vintage cars have a lot of charm and can make for a really cool garage, but some people are impatient to live that George Jetson life in a spaceship car. Briefcase parking optional. We have seen the future, and that future is the earliest days of polygon-based graphics. The Tesla Cybertruck is designed with a nod to a time when curves were not computers' best suit. Before that, however, architectural high heel designer United Nude was already on board with her 2016 wallpaper design award-winning car, the Low Res. The design process started simply enough, lower the resolution of the classic Lamborghini Countach until it's at its most basic shape. To keep the line simple, they did away with doors and the entire body lifts up like a funny car. Driver and passenger sit tandem with 360 degree views from the inside. An electric motor will push the low res at 31 miles per hour, which is probably twice as fast as you want to go in it. The car was featured in the video for Rich the Kid's song, New Freezer. In October 2021, the low res was auctioned on the website Bring a Trailer for the Peterson Auto Museum, where it was sold for $111,111. Fitting. Maybe the future is curves and not angles. If that's your take, then Mike Vetter of MTV Designs will make you his extraterrestrial vehicle. Located in Miami, Vetter is known for his unique designs with the ETV, certainly one of the most striking. While most custom shops are content installing speakers and way too many screens into a car and calling it custom, the ETV is a ground up creation. Leather trim lines, the seats and interior, which is accessed by a custom made butterfly door. Power comes from a 2-liter GM engine, with performance not really being the point. Low visibility from the inside certainly contributes to the boulevard, not racetrack, set of priorities. To help it out, it has cameras that will feed the driver a view of the road and all the people gawking at your space car. Each ETV is custom built to the specifications of the buyer. Better's personal one, which he says he uses a lot, includes a back seat for his daughter. Once upon a time, there was a company that wanted to revolutionize the world with a three-wheeled car. That is, until they were unable to raise the conditional $80 million to secure a $150 million federal loan, which is the beginning to a lot of stories. And yet, there are not a lot of three-wheel cars. One of those is Aptera, and they're dramatically teardrop-shaped 2E. Aptera means flightless bird, a nod to the notion that the car itself looks like someone stripped the wings off a plane complete with the wheel canopies. Founded in 2008, they had a prototype for car and driver to drive around in 2010. Before failure to secure a $150 million loan, they closed in 2011. But that wasn't the end. In 2019, the original founders returned and now they're taking $100 deposits on their new EV with a modified version of the teardrop shape. But now, it includes a solar roof that the company says will give the car 45 miles of charge if you leave it in the sun all day, claiming that the car will have an assisted range of 1,000 miles. Prices for the new model could range from 26 to 45,000. While some companies think that EVs have had too many wheels, Professor Hiroshi Shimizu and a team of his students feel like electrics didn't have enough wheels. In a design worthy of Lady Penelope, the Elica, short for electric lithium ion car, if you squint, features eight wheels with a motor in each hub. This spacey design was in 2004, four years before the first Tesla hit the streets. Like Tesla, Elica was full of promises. All eight motors added up to 800 horsepower that transitions from rest to zero to 60 miles per hour in less than four seconds. The goal was to hit the Veyron's 250 mile per hour top speed but had to settle on 230 miles per hour on a test track. It also beat the Model X by having conventional front doors and gold wing rear doors. Batteries were lined down the center under the car, giving it even more stability, just in case the eight tires weren't enough. The Space Age car with enough wheels for two cars was not going to be cheap, with an expected price of around $300,000. When you're rich enough and well known as a lover of cars, you don't have to go to boutique shops in Miami to make you a unique car. You can have one of the largest automotive companies in the world make you a car that you design on a napkin. So Jay Leno had GM design him the turbine-powered GM EcoJet. The idea was to create an environmentally friendly sports car. Somewhere along the way, things got out of hand. And a $150,000, 650-horsepower turbine engine from a helicopter found its way into the center of a Corvette chassis with a Starfighter body wrapped around it in carbon fiber. The car is loud, it's low, it's hard to see out of, and its environmentally friendly part is that it generously drinks biodiesel. 
but it's tons of fun, even when it doesn't stay together. Showing off to Neil deGrasse Tyson, the EcoJet lost a window at 130 miles per hour. They took it in stride and kept on to 167 miles per hour because where they were going, they didn't need windows. Theoretically, you can't circumnavigate the world in a car without having to lean on either boats or planes to cover the part not made for cars, the ocean. Since the planet is mostly ocean, that's an obstacle, but not for the surface orbiter, an amphibious expedition vehicle built on a milk container, because why not? Shaped like a rocket tipped on its side was the project of Rick Doberton and his wife Karen. They decided to take Rick's skills as a hot rod car builder and apply them to the insulated milk tank with a cone-shaped front cabin added and a custom chassis built that sent power from the turbo diesel engine to the rear axles, the massive amphibious motorhome was ready for a life of adventure. Kinda. The couple made it down the east coast around the bottom of South America, working its way to Los Angeles, covering around 33,000 miles, with 3,000 of those being over water. But while it could float, it wasn't great at it, and the wear and tear took a toll on both the surface orbiter and the couple's marriage. Their adventure began in 1993 and ended in 1996. Rick did try and sell the surface orbiter for $200,000, years later letting it go for an unknown sum to a collector. When movies depict the near future, auto companies can sometimes be eager to have their own brand be part of that future. Audi has done this from the iRobot to the Avengers. Mercedes-Benz teamed up with the filmmaker James Cameron to promote the movie Avatar. With the Vision AVTR, they had one advantage. There were no cars in that movie. Instead, they went with a mechanical organic design, including a series of motorized scales on its back that can be configured for aerodynamics or to signal other drivers. The most striking thing about the concept car, however, is the giant moon wheels that allow the car to crab walk, that is, move left or right while still moving forward. The car is a design exercise with no specific weird oogly car plan based on it, so we'll all have to keep parallel parking the old-fashioned way. Between the movie Ford vs Ferrari and not one, but two retro supercars wearing the GT badge, the GT40 is a well-recognized car, even if you're not a historic racing fan. Before all that, however, Ford celebrated the anniversary of their Le Mans win in another dramatic fashion. The space-age-looking GT90 unveiled in 1995 at a production cost estimated at $3 million. Its look predicated the angular stealth fighter look that would dominate design in the 21st century. Since they were going nuts on the outside, they decided they should go nuts on the inside. Built on a Jaguar XJ220, it housed a V12, formed from their modular V8. Then, just for giggles, they attached four turbos. The end result was a car that could clear the quarter mile in 10 seconds and had an expected top speed of 250 miles per hour, which would have made it the fastest car of its time, except Ford wasn't in a position to produce a V12 car in 1995, so it remained a show-off car, but you could still drive it in the video game Gran Turismo 2 and Need for Speed 2. Concept cars were an even bigger part of promoting a brand and its technology in the middle of the century, and GM tapped into the rocket age for their rocket ship inspired Firebird 3 concept in 1958. That includes the turbine engine, as Leno's EcoJet wasn't the first foray into turbine concept cars. The Firebird 1 was built for speed, but crashed at speed with an executive on board. So Firebird 2 was built for practicality, including an early autonomous mode that would follow a wire in the highway of the future. 70 years later, we're not in that future. Firebird 3 was the porridge just right of the first two. It featured dramatic fins and a double bubble canopy to complete the jet fighter look. Design elements from the Firebird 3 would find their way onto production cars like the 1959 and 61 Cadillac. Most concept cars live out their lives going to car shows and doing press demonstrations and then collecting dust in the manufacturer's storage. Then some get cast at the center of a cult supernatural street racing movie like the Dodge M4S. The car's shining moment was meant to be as a pace car for the 1986 Indianapolis 500 but it's better known as a supernatural hot rod from the movie The Wraith. The premise was that Charlie Sheen's character had come back from the dead to seek his revenge against a gang of street racers in an unnamed desert town. The movie is almost as ridiculous and glorious as the car itself. The car was crafted to resemble the prototype race cars of the time and powered by a twin turbo, four-cylinder, good for 440 horsepower, 
that will push the slippery car to just shy of 200 miles an hour. The whole project took 1.5 million. Six copies and the original were used in the film, which has gained the car itself a bit of a cult following. It is the best part. That and Randy Quaid coming up with insults for the car gang's lackeys. Concept cars are a vision of what could be. Supercars and hypercars are an expression of what's possible if you don't care how much a car costs. Like the $1.6 million SSC Tuatara, built for the increasingly ridiculous prize of fastest production car. For reference, the target now is north of 300 miles an hour for a car that wears license plates. The Tuatara briefly held the title before it turned out they weren't able to go as fast as they claimed. All cars trying to carve 300 miles per hour out of the wind have a sleek spaceship look to them, but the Tuatara steps it up with some of its small aerodynamic features like two small stabilizing fins on the back. It turns out the breaking point for electric cars was discovering that they weren't just the tree hugging option, they were also the go fast option. That led to sports car makers employing electricity to their go fast. Few now have gone all in as Lotus with their $2.3 million Evaya. All battery electric, the 2000 horsepower, that's right, 2000 horsepower, battery electric seems shaped by the future. While normal fast cars are slippery, the Avaya is designed to let air pass through the car for both low wind resistance and to be positioned for downforce when you try and get the 200 mile per hour car to change direction. There's another supercar designer that's been so far ahead of the curve, his innovative race car designs kept getting banned. One of his most famous makes a return on his future of the supercar, the $3 million Murray T50. Designer Gordon Murray knows something about shaping the future of supercars. His design for the McLaren F1 with its center driving position set the stage for the high speed race that spawned cars like the Tuatara earlier. Murray isn't chasing top speed now, but ultimate downforce. Adopting the fan car design he did for the Brabham F1 fan car that featured a fan off the back that drew air in from under the car, essentially sucking it to the ground. It also gives the car a look like it's about to launch into space. Just like major manufacturers, boutique designers like to show off now and then too, like Giorgetto Gijaro of Itao Design and his son Fabrizio of GFG Style and their supercar concept Kangaroo. The biggest issue with supercars is that they're fragile and fussy. They can't go fast for very long on anything but glass smooth roads lest they shake themselves to pieces. GFG envisions a supercar that is every bit of supercar on the road, but when the road ends, the fun doesn't. That's because it has an off-road mode that raises the car up. Is it fit for the Rubicon? No, but it's one up on that Ferrari you got stuck behind going over a speed bump at an angle going 2 miles an hour. The simple clean shape crafted by air with all the aerodynamic aids give it that spaceship look. Cars are nice because they keep the outside out and the inside in, and they protect you from other cars. Motorcycles are great because they're compact and efficient. Lit Motors wants to be the best of both worlds with their C1 that they spent $3.5 million to develop as of 2015 when it won the Popular Science Invention Award. It's a two-wheeled vehicle with a covered driver's cabin. But the biggest selling point is that it's self-leveling. Leave the C1 sitting and it will sit there upright waiting for you. That's courtesy of two of the mounted gyros underneath the C1. It's billed as a two-wheel, self-leveling car. The vehicle is the brainchild of Daniel Kim, who after having a Land Rover Defender he was working on almost fall on him, he thought people had way more car than they needed. People riding around in self-leveling fully enclosed two-wheelers is just the kind of thing for those antiseptic future utopias. Fastest, most powerful, biggest, those are all easy common benchmarks to hit and have given us 300 mile an hour cars. Volkswagen, parent company to Bugatti, decided to see what it took to become the fuel efficiency champ and the result is a $120,000 XL1. How does 283 miles per gallon grab you? Volkswagen achieved that by using all of the gas saving design techniques in one car. It's small, it has low resistance tires, it weighs only 1,800 pounds, it has a hybrid diesel powertrain. It looks like what you'd ride if you had to escape from the International Space Station. If you're thinking you'd very much like a car that gets 283 miles per gallon right about now, it's not just the six-figure price tag in your way. Only 250 were made, and none were destined for American roads. If GM had known the age of the electric car was just around the corner, they may not have crushed all of their battery electric, the EV1. But the influence of the storied experiment, empowering cars by electricity rather than internal combustion, has been pretty wide-ranging. 
The story of that car inspired the original founders of Tesla Motors, who would later get an investment of one Elon Musk. The Volkswagen XL1 seems to get most of its shape from the 90s battery electric. Whether or not the car was a success depends on how you define success. The people who lease them in general love them and offer to buy them off GM when the program halted rather than get them back to have them crushed. The main difference between the modern EV and the EV1 is the batteries. The EV1 used the old style lead acid batteries, giving it a range of around 50 miles and a lengthy recharge. Regardless, the EV1 didn't just look like the future, it turned out to be the future in different forms. Art Deco cars are some of the most beautifully designed cars ever made. They were shaped by the wind in a time before wind tunnels, so they were heavier on style than function. These cars were hand-built and rare at the time. Now models like the Bugatti Type 57 demands prices as high as $30 million. That's not a car you take down the boulevard. For $250,000, Delahaye USA will make you a car inspired by those cars. The Bugnati. The Bugnati features swooping Art Deco lines that look like it could leave the ground to hunt down Buck Rogers, with modern drive gears underneath to make sure that you get where you're going. The massive paws hiding the tire lend even more to that impression. In the 80s, a man named Jeffrey Weigert thought that America should be getting in on the supercar game to compete with Lamborghini. The initial result was the Vector W2, a car that car and driver called a low-flying fighter car that looks like a UFO. Powered by a twin-turbo V8, it was low, it was sleek, it seemed to be what people would race in the future. It appeared in magazines, where pictures of it would get torn out and put on kids' walls, dreaming of the day they donned their leather jacket and wayfarers and drove off into the horizon, presumably leaving a red streak from the taillights because they're moving so fast. The problem is, 12-year-old boys did not have a lot of money to invest in the development of supercars, and investors were not as enthused. Only one prototype was made, and Vector slowly faded away. In the 70s, if you were impatient for that futuristic look and weren't as concerned with go as much you were for show, there was the Sterling, or Nova, if you were in the UK. The catch was, they came some assembly required and were built on top of a donor Volkswagen Beetle, not famous for its ability to tear up the track, unless its name was also Herbie. The biggest thing that sets the low wedge shaped car apart is how you get in and out. The entire roof lifts up to allow the driver to step into the car. Its crazy no way look has meant that it's appeared in television and movies to lend an air of the exotic. They seem inexpensive until you buy one and find out what problems follow a car built in someone's garage. It was also the basis for the Condor car from the movie Condor Man. No competition creates more sci-fi looking space cars than the World Solar Challenge, and the engineers race to create efficient cars powered by nothing but sunlight. Solar Team Eindhoven, from where else, the Technical University of Eindhoven had produced a solar positive car, meaning it collected more energy than it used. The team has decided to take their technology to the public, forming Lightyear. Their first car, the $170,000 Lightyear 1. The cars built in solar panels give the car a combined range of 450 miles. The company boasts in sunny conditions, with no more use, the car can end up going months without having to be recharged. Having to bow to the demands of drag coefficients, the car has that smooth space age look to it. If $170,000 is too spicy for your taste, Lightyear has promised a $30,000 follow-up. For better or worse, Tesla has become the standard bearer for the electric car, but being first only gets you so far, and you have to constantly innovate because the big competition is coming. In pickups, that means startups like Rivian and giants like Ford are racing Tesla to the pickup market, and Rivian has already got a head start with the R1T, already in customers' hands. The Cybertruck stands out the old-fashioned way by looking completely crazy. It uses a similar aesthetic to the low res, with a polygonal shape reminiscent of a science fiction of the 80s. So far, it's packed full of Tesla's promises, including a range up to 500 miles and being bullet resistant for some reason. The windows are not quite as tough as Musk thought though. Orders for the Cybertruck have been brisk, but we still have not seen its final form. Not all sci-fi looking cars are concepts or tragic stories of cars that never made it to market, or even made by some obscure manufacturer. Like the $147,500 BMW i8 Hybrid, BMW have been betting big on hydrogen, selling the hydrogen powered 7 series in Southern California dating back to the 90s. When they finally gave a hybrid a go, they did it in a very BMW way. The i8 featured a clamshell design and butterfly doors. In a combo breaker, the car was fairly successful, 
running from 2014 to 2020, where it's being replaced by the next generation of electric cars. They also offered special designers additions who wanted their sci-fi ride to be a little extra special. How heavy was that briefcase once George Jetson had it fold itself into a briefcase? Is that the detail that we miss from the Jetsons? That people in the future have super strength? Or is it low gravity in the stilt city that George works at?